Hi, and welcome to Introductory Statistics. This is a very basic statistics course. It's going to cover the beginnings of statistics, but it will still be a bit challenging. And with this video, we're at the very, very introduction, the very beginning of all beginnings of statistics, because in order to do statistics, we need to first have data. And in order to get the data, we need to gather the data through sampling. So this chapter is about how to sample and how and what data is. And so we're covering many of the beginning ideas of statistics. With all chapters and with everything throughout this entire course, I would say be ready with your formula card, your calculator, and your lecture notes. Um, particularly on taking notes here, you'll want your formula card and your calculator. Not so much in this chapter, although maybe a little bit in this chapter, um, but definitely in future chapters, your formula card and your calculator are going to be the most important tools of the entire course. The formula card has on the right side little calculator shortcuts, so the formula card will help you not just with formulas, but also with your calculator, and then the calculator will do most of the heavy work for us this term. We're going to use the calculator a lot. And then lecture notes, um, these can be found in the course in addition to the formula card that can be found in the course. Um, the lecture notes are going to be printed co copies that you can print that will have uh, pictures of all of the slides that we'll use in these videos. And then you can just write on top of them your own notes and you can use those for really all three of these plus your textbook uh, as a resource when you're doing almost everything in the entire course, whether it is the discussion post, you should use all these resources on those for sure. You should use them on the homework and the quizzes and the projects. And then if you are taking a test, you'll have the first two. I'll provide a formula card for you, a clean copy of the formula card, and you can bring your TI-83 or TI-84 calculator to use. Uh, so you will have these first two resources even on the exams. Uh, so, what is statistics? Statistics involves three different things. Uh, it can be designing the studies, how we're going to collect the data, how we're going to sample, and then actually going out and sampling. It involves analyzing the data that we get from that sampling, and then translating those statistics that we get from our analysis into what that means for the entire population. Um, so that gives us knowledge and understanding about the entire population population. Uh, so what is data more specifically? It's the information that we're going to gather and we gather it two ways through experiments and through observational studies. Uh, the most common type of observational study being surveys. Uh, an experiment might be for example like on the effectiveness of coronavirus, coronavirus vaccine. Um, do they get the virus or do they not get the virus? Uh, and what are the symptoms that they have with having actually been getting the vaccine or whether they had the placebo or not. And then what's the severity of the virus? How many times were they hospitalized? How severe were their symptoms at home? And that sort of thing. Uh, on the other hand, uh, so an experiment, you're going to actually do something to the subject, like give them, potentially give them the coronavirus vaccine. Um, so you're doing something to the subjects to see what effect that has. So those who get the vaccine, do they act different than those who got the placebo, which is like a fake vaccine. So you're not going to know whether you're getting the vaccine or the fake vaccine. And so uh, that will help the researcher to know for sure that if the vaccine people had better results, that it was because of the vaccine and not because uh, they thought they got the vaccine. Uh, but the survey is different and the observational studies are different from experiments because they're not going to have something that they think will change the results, that you as the researcher thinks will change the results. There's not going to be that thing um, in there. So, for instance, uh, you might air a television ad for Starbucks if you're working for Starbucks as a researcher. You air a television ad and people either see it or they don't. And then you look at uh, the local Starbucks where you aired the ad and see if there's an uptick in sales. So if there's an uptick in sales in the area where you aired the ad uh, that is not in other areas, then you can say, hey, yeah, that's probably from the ad that we aired. And so that's observational studies. Uh, so in more detail, observational studies is just watching. It's just observing. It's not doing stuff to the subject. Uh, so you are just 
merely observing um, and you're taking in the values of the response and explanatory variables, but you're not doing anything to your subjects that you think would change their response. Uh, and all of this involves randomness. Whether you're doing an experiment or an observational study, you should be using random subjects, um, random samples. And so what is randomness? Vegas is the perfect picture of randomness because all of the different things that you can do in Vegas, whether it's the roulette wheel or rolling some dice or uh, drawing a card, all of those are going to have equal opportunities of landing on a specific number or drawing a specific card. Every card is going to be equally likely. Every slot in the roulette wheel is going to be equally likely. Every side of a die is going to be equally likely. And so that's what it means to be truly random. Uh, and so we've talked a bit about populations and samples already. Uh, and you'll see the population is every single person that you're going to care about when you're doing either a, an experiment or an observational study. Um, so every person of interest, every subject of interest. But your sample is going to be the people you're going to collect the data from. Uh, so that's going to be who you're going to survey. That is your sample. Uh, so notice that we have uh, different people um, all over the crowd, all over our population, that we're picking out of the crowd uh, to make up our sample. And hopefully we're doing that at completely at random, um, so they're not all grouped in one homogeneous little bunch. Um, so once we have our sample, uh, we can do the third process of statistics, which is translating the analysis of that sample into what it means for the entire population. Um, and we call that inference, so making inferences. Uh, making conclusions about the entire population based on our sample. Uh, so our sample is just a subset of the population. It's always a part of the population, um, but it's a smaller number, uh, very much smaller number of the population. One of the big misunderstandings about statistics is that the sample needs to be almost as big as the population, or a huge fraction, like a third or a half, or, or even a tenth of the population in order to be legitimate. And that's just not true. Um, that's not at all true, not even a little bit true. We, we do have better results with a larger sample. We have more certainty um, that our larger sample represents the entire population. But we don't need an enormous sample, especially if we had the entire population of the United States of America, 330 million. If we did 10%, that would be 33 million. So if you think about all of the statistics that you see every day, whether you know it or not, you see probably a dozen statistics a day, at least. Um, if you read the newspaper, you see a hundred statistics a day, perhaps. Um, so television ads that talk about uh, different drugs, they will throw some statistics at you. You may not recognize it. Uh, news programs will constantly throw statistics at you, especially during election season. But even outside of election season, there are a lot of statistics that you'll see in news and media. And uh, so think about all of the statistics that you've encountered in your lifetime, probably millions of statistics. And think about how many of those research studies did you participate in? Did you participate in 10% of them? Then maybe 10% is not the sample size that we need to use. Um, it, did you participate in 5% of them? Did you participate in 1% of them? You probably didn't even participate in a hundredth of a percent of all of the research that's out there. Um, and so uh, the you, you don't have to have a particular percentage of the population to be your sample is my point. Um, you do have to have, um, to, to make some conclusions, you do have to have what we consider to be a large sample size, and in Chapter 7 we'll talk about that as being 30 or more. And that is a magic number and happens to be why for your projects you'll be gathering data values of 30 or more. Uh, so a parameter, you'll see parameter and population have the same letters. Uh, a parameter is a numerical summary of the population, um, and it's, it's nice to remember those two because Parameter starts with a P and population starts with a P. Uh, statistic is also a numerical summary, but it goes with the sample. Um, so statistic and sample. And so uh, an example of a statistic or a numerical summary might be the mean. 
the sample name. We'll call it x with a bar on top. That represents the sample mean. And then the population mean, and let's see, I can't draw it very well. It's supposed to look like a, a curvy M or a curvy U, um, but our sample mean estimates the population mean. So our statistic S represents our population parameter P. So stat and then the parameter. Um, another statistic might be the sample standard deviation, S, and then it might estimate the population standard deviation, which is sigma. Um, and so uh, again, this is these things are for the sample, they're measurements of the sample, and these things are measurements of the population. Um, so uh, parameter and population, statistic and sample go together. And then we want to talk about four different types of sampling. There are uh, four different types of random sampling. And that's our goal, of course, is to do random sampling. Uh, so the four different types of random sampling all involve a random number generator. So every single type of sampling will involve a random number generator. Uh, and to do a simple random sampling, you could have a random number generator just by putting names in a hat and shaking the hat and then generating out different numbers or different names. But most of the time, what you'll do is you will assign every single member of the entire population a number. Uh, and you might alphabetize a list, for instance. It doesn't matter if the list is ordered or not. Um, you assign them numbers from one to whatever, and then you're going to use the random number generator. Uh, and let me show you that on the calculator. Um, so the random number generator, we will do math, and then probability, and then randint is what we want, because what we want is we want to use a random number generator to tell us, um, let's suppose we want three as our sample size. Um, and I'm doing such a small number because our population is small. Um, so we want three as our sample size. And so we will um, want three integers between one and 12. And that's why we'll use option five for random integer. And uh, I've already actually put everything in here. So our smallest number is always going to be 1 because we'll number our subjects from 1 to whatever. Our largest number should always be the size of the population. Here that's 12. And then our n for the rand n should always be the size of our sample. Now it turns out that this function, um, it does not always give you unique numbers. So we may need to do the function like twice and that'll be easy. Um, to if, in case we have any repetition. So um, 1, 12, and 3. So it's going to give us random numbers between 1 and 12. It's going to give us three random numbers. That's what this is saying. And so it does. It tells us that 6, 4, and 12. So our sixth person, we would look on our list and see who that is. Our fourth person on our list and our last person on our list would be the three who would make up our sample. And it's chosen at random because we let the calculator choose for us. Now, if it happened that we got 4, 4, 12, for instance, then we would need one more number. And so we could just hit enter again, and it would do that random calculation again and give us a different random set of numbers. Then we could do it again and again and again. Um, it turns out that the calculator is not truly random in its starting place. For instance, if you had two brand new calculators and did this function for the very first time, you would get the same set of numbers um, and so on and so forth. So it's not truly random, but at least it's more random than us choosing. We want to take the researcher out of this equation and not give the researcher a choice because choice is not truly random. Anything that involves choice is not truly random, which is why every truly random method is going to involve some random number generator. Um, that's absolutely critical to uh, the random sampling process. And for cluster random sampling, what we'll do is we will first divide the data into different groups. We'll do that for the next one as well, the strata 
stratified random sampling. Um, so for both the next two, we divide them into groups. With cluster, the way we determine groups is usually geographic because we're going to take whole clusters at a time, and that will save us an enormous amount of money. Let's suppose we want to survey and the entire world is our population, and we want to gather a thousand data values in the entire world. We don't want to go to a thousand different countries, a thousand different states, a thousand different cities, a thousand different blocks. We don't want to have to track down all over the world, um, every country in the world. Uh, we do want to try to have a lot of clusters, so we might have 10 or 20 clusters, um, but then our clusters would be defined as like city blocks and they would have maybe 100 people or more in them, um, maybe maybe at least 50 people in them. So we would do 20, 20 city blocks all around the world and we would get our data that we need. So we would first divide it into the clusters that we would want. Um, so let's call this cluster one and we'll call this cluster two and three and four and five and six. And then once we have our clusters, we would use a random number generator to tell us which of the clusters are going to be part of our sample. Um, and without that random number generator, we wouldn't really have a truly random sample. Um, so we will use uh, the random number generator, and I've already done it here. Uh, so uh, one to six is the number of clusters that we have in this example, but you would probably have much more in a real life scenario. We only want two clusters in this example, but in real life, I would say a minimum of four or five clusters um, because you're gonna want to establish uh, a lot of variability and you're not going to have much variability if you only choose two clusters. Um, so you want, I would say, a bare minimum of four or five. Ideally um, five to ten um, or if you're doing a sample of size a thousand, um, even more than that. Uh, but here we have selected three and four as our sample. Uh, so let me get the pen back. So three to four would be our sample. Here though, um, in this one, they selected three and six. And that's fine because we chose random. So we shouldn't have the same. Uh, the fact that one of them is the same is a little strange, but um, it's bound to happen when you're choosing two. You know, it's, it's pretty normal to happen. And then um, for them, they would survey person five, six, 11, and 12. And for us, we would survey persons five, six, seven, and eight. So that would give us our samples. Uh, and then uh, here, group one and group four were chosen. But again, they divided the population into different groups. And then they used a random number generator to say which of these four groups were going to be part of the sample. And the advantages of cluster sampling are obvious if you are dispersed all over the world. You would only have to go to maybe 10 different cities um, in 10 different countries in the world uh, to gather your data instead of going to a thousand different cities. Uh, the disadvantage is that you're going to need to have a larger sample size um, to have enough clusters uh, to give us the true variability that we're seeking and to be accurate. And But that's usually an easy payoff if you are talking about the entire world or even an entire state as your population. Um, it would pay off pretty well to do a cluster sample. Stratified also breaks up into groups, but it's different. Um, so it's not usually geographic for stratified. Uh, you are trying to identify characteristics that might affect the outcome. So let's say uh, that you are doing a political poll and you um, want to ask which candidate a person is voting for. And you definitely want to get uh, Democrats and you definitely want to get Republicans, and you probably want to get independents. So um, you would do Democrats blue and Republicans red, and maybe independents would be green. And so you're going to choose an equal proportion from each of these. I only did it that way because of the, the colors. Democrats usually are blue and Republicans red. Um, but uh, here, Republicans are twice as much as Democrats. But in real life, it is a pretty even split between the two, and, and then independents are usually far less, far fewer um, than the two big parties. And so uh, whichever you have, you're going to choose proportionally from each category, uh, and that's the correct way to do it. Sometimes your book will choose an equal number from each category, but to be truly correct, to use this method correctly and accurately um, and to its full advantage, 
you should really choose proportionally. So that if you have categories that have twice as much um, in the population, then it should have twice as many in the sample as well. Um, so that's the true advantage of stratified, uh, is that you can make sure that every category is not underrepresented and it's not overrepresented. Um, and so the way the book sometimes does it wrong is, is interesting. <laughs> Um, and then the last method that we'll talk about for random sampling methods is systematic. And even the systematic uses a random number generator at the very beginning. Um, so the first subject chosen will be using a random number generator, and then they will add a specific number here. That number is three. We should determine our number by taking the population size and dividing it by the sample size. For instance, if you were going to um, a city, that had a population of 100,000 and your sample size uh, was 10, uh, then you would take your um, population of 100,000 and divide it by 10, and so you would be adding 10,000. Um, so go every 10,000th person, for instance. So that's systematic sampling. Uh, and then the last way to sample is actually a bad way to sample, a poor way to sample. The textbook kind of makes that a little ambiguous and says sometimes it, it is a truly representative sample and sometimes not. Um, but I would say to err on the side of caution because we don't know if it's going to give us good results or not. Um, it's not likely to give us good results. Uh, so a convenient sample what is a convenient sample? It might be um, saying, okay, I want to do a survey and I'll just go survey the people at work. Uh, so perhaps your survey is on technology and you happen to work for Google. Um, so you'll say, how uh, many uh, internet devices do you have at home? So that would like include computers, phones, maybe watches if they're smart watches, um, certainly smart televisions. Uh, so you just include any device that's internet capable. Um, if, and if your population happens to be all Tennessee residents, but you are surveying at Amazon or Google, um, then you're going to get results in your sample that will not match the results in the entire population. Um, so to survey people you know, to survey people from work, um, could be biased in a positive way or biased in a negative way. Um, and it's not likely to represent the entire population, which is our, always our goal, is to represent the entire population. Um, also, I, I chose this because um, online polling, if you, if you do your poll online, that is a convenience too, um, because it's easy to set up and you don't have to actually go to different locations and use a random number generator and, and all of that complicated stuff. So doing online surveys um, is easy to do as well. Um, but with that, uh, think about how many online surveys you've ignored. And so uh, if somebody actually comes up in person and asks you questions, uh, then you're more likely to respond to the in-person surveys than you are, I would say, uh, probably a hundred, maybe even a thousand times more likely to respond to a survey in person than you are to respond to a survey online. Uh, and whether your sample is convenient or whether it's truly random and an absolutely perfect, truly perfectly random uh, sample, you're still going to have error. So your sample statistic, your sample mean, your sample standard deviation might not match exactly the population mean or the population standard deviation. And that's okay, but we've got to acknowledge that there is sampling error. Um, and that will, of course, bleed over into all kinds of statistical errors that we will have in using our statistics to estimate parameters. So that's something to be aware of, just the natural variation in your data will mean that you aren't going to be 100% accurate in using the sample to estimate the entire population. Uh, and then we have experiments as well. So with experiments, we are going to do something to the subjects. And then we're going to think that that's something that we're doing is going to change the results. And that's the big difference between an experiment and an observational study. The observational study doesn't do anything to the subjects that they think changes the results. The experiment does. We're doing stuff to the subjects that we think will alter the results. Um, so with experiments, we've got kind of four different elements. We've got the subjects that we're studying, the things that we're doing things to, um, and then we have the treatments, and that's what we're doing to the subjects. How, how are we changing the subjects? Um, and that's determined by the explanatory variable. 
Um, so the explanatory variable could be, uh, for example, a coronavirus treatment drug. So you're giving all these patients who have been diagnosed with coronavirus, you're giving them a specific type of drug. Um, so you may be giving them a placebo, you may be giving them a low dose of the drug, um, a medium dose of the drug, a high dose of the drug. That's four different values of the drug that you could be giving them for the treatment. And that's one variable. Some experiments could have multiple variables. So you could do a drug with four different levels, and then you could do um, this kind of meditation therapy or breathing therapy, maybe. Um, so, and you could do different amounts of time of breathing therapy. And so you could have different variables and different, lots of different treatments, um, lots of different treatment groups. And then what happens to the patient as a result, uh, measuring their symptom levels, uh, that's going to be your outcome. Uh, in more detail, subjects could be individual people, it could be entire schools, it could be animals, um, it could be counties, um, it could be something technological like widgets. Uh, the variable, uh, we've talked about this a little bit, to vary means to change, to be able to have different values. So, uh, for instance, here in this picture you see lots of different colors of houses. Um, so color could be a variable. Color would be a categorical variable because it doesn't have a number. Um, categorical or sometimes it's called quant qualitative. Um, qualities, categories. Um, that's going to be stuff that doesn't have numbers. Quantitative, the root word is quantity. Um, so quantitative um, is going to be numerical stuff. Um, and then there are two types of quantitative variables, discrete or continuous. Uh, discrete being the whole number, continuous being not a whole number, um, it measured more and more precisely. Uh, so in more detail, a categorical variable could be asking things like gender, um, religion, the type of residence, uh, belief in life after death. All of those different things will have categories um, instead of numbers, and so they are categorical variables. And then quantitative variables could be age, number of siblings, annual income, stuff with that would have number answers would be quantitative variables. Um, and the reason we split the two is because some quantitative variables, we can do measures of center, like the mean and the median, that aren't possible for categorical variables. We can't average red, yellow, and green, for instance. Um, we can't measure the deviation between red, yellow, and green. We can't take the standard deviation of those numbers. Um, what we can do for categorical, though, is we can do number, the number of things in a certain category, or the proportion or the percentage. Um, and we'll talk about those in just a second, proportion and percentage. Um, so proportion and percentage are great for categorical, um, whereas mean, median, mode, um, which we'll talk about in the next chapter, in detail, measures of center and measures of spread, those are really better for quantitative data. Um, discrete, uh, for the quantitative variable, it can be broken up into discrete or continuous, remember? Uh, so discrete might be the number of pets in a household, the number of children in a family, the number of foreign languages spoken. So anything that's a whole number value, or in some rare circumstances, you might have a ratio or a fraction value, um, but certainly it's not going to keep going out forever and ever and ever, more and more precisely. Um, and then the continuous variable is going to keep going out forever and ever and ever, more and more precisely. Um, and continuous variables are always measurements. So you can measure height, you can measure weight, you can measure age. Age is actually a measurement of time, and even though we give age as a whole number value almost all the time, especially if you're my age, um, if you are two, you might say two and a half, two and three quarters, so on and so forth. Um, but uh, once you get above 13, you stop doing that um, for the most part. Um, and you just give whole number values. But even so, you can, if you wanted to, give age more and more precisely. Um, the same is true really of all of these. We rarely give height in, uh, in anything but inches and feet, feet and inches, unless you're short and you... <laughs> it's like the same thing with age. Unless you're young, unless you're short, and you always give that half inch. I'm five two and a half. Now five two, five two and a half. Um, and that's actually my height that I'm giving as an example there. So um, blood pressure uh, is usually given as a whole number value, but it could be measured more precisely. Um, proportion and percentage. We mentioned these earlier. 
uh, for categorical variables that they're great to do for categorical variables. So what you would do is you would take all the frequencies of all of the categories as your denominator. Let's say your population is the cars in a parking lot um, and the color of those cars is your variable um, and so you would count maybe the number of red cars in the parking lot and uh, of the total number of cars in the parking lot. And so let's say you have five red cars in a parking lot of um, 37 vehicles, so 5 37ths would be your proportion. And then your percentage, you just take the proportion and multiply by 100% to get the percentage. Uh, and then as you work on your homework, uh, keep these lecture notes handy, um, but also the first two things that we talked about, the formula card and the calculator. Um, and we didn't talk about this for watching the videos. I don't think they're needed for watching the videos, but they are needed, especially for discussions and projects. Um, but I would also use them occasionally uh, when you're stuck on questions on the homework or quizzes, and that's your, your textbook. Um, and certainly the Newton instruction, even while you're doing the homework, um, is useful. But the, the textbook will be a really nice resource, especially for uh, the projects and the discussions. And then if all of these things don't work, send me a message. Thank you.